All right, guys, are you ready? Should we get started? Cool, so I don't want to take too long on chapter two. Um, I know you guys had some questions about price floors and price ceilings, so I'm gonna do like a couple of problems really quick about those. But then I really want to move on to chapter three because that's got elasticity, which is kind of tricky. And then also it has regression analysis, which is really important, but it's probably completely new to you guys, right? In terms of like what what's the stats level of everybody here? Everything's new. Okay, so yeah, we've taken no stats classes, right? Or maybe one in the past. Okay, so yeah, so I want to make sure because that's really important because essentially all of the facts, all of the numbers that we're that we're getting are coming from these types of analysis, and so you guys will not have to run that type of analysis although it's not really that hard. Um, but you will have to know how to interpret it, okay? So I want to make sure that, that I at least start covering that today. And then, um, like I said before, please, please email me questions or screenshots of problems that you're having in the homework or the Learn Smarts or whatever. And then uh, since we're not meeting on Friday, I'll make videos and put them up by Friday afternoon so that you guys have some solutions so that you can, you can watch that video and learn how to do it and then solve a similar problem on the home. Does that make sense? But I need, I need, I need more input from you guys in terms of what questions, you know, because I, I, you know, there's time constraints and I, you know, I, I just don't know which ones to do. Does that make sense? So feel free, feel free to, to shoot me screenshots, to shoot me, you know, uh, chapter or whatever, number or whatever. Um, and, you know, even if it's the homework, like I'm not going to write a video on how to do that exact problem, but I'll switch the numbers up. And, or I'll find a similar problem and I'll make, I'll make a video about to solve that, okay? All right, so let's just jump right into chapter two material. What about what? Chapter one? Yeah. Which one? We can go back. Oh, that's right, I had you guys do something. Okay. So chapter one, uh, page, what is it, 24, number nine, and it's F and G. Okay, cool. So, so what minimizes total cost, right? So I told you guys there was a spoiler alert. Let's try and focus this doodle. There we go. 
So, uh, what Q minimizes total cost? And so we know that the shape of, of, of uh, the cost function is something like this, right? We, we, we drew out the shape and we, we learned that it was a convex curve, right? It's got a positive slope and the slope is, so the slope is maybe like one right here, right? In terms of one rise over one run, but then over here, the slope ends up being a lot steeper, right? And it's probably like two rise for one run. And so that's how we know it's a convex curve because the slope is increasing, right? It's, it's what we would say it's increasing at an increasing rate. And so we know just from looking at this visually that the minimum is going to be right here at zero, right? But how do we actually show that? And it's not always going to be a curve exactly like this. It might be a curve that is that all right yeah it could be like this and so then it's not it's not going to be that value it's going to be this value right here right and what's going on with the slope of this value the slope is zero so that is why at the end of the day to find a local minimum or a local maximum you take the derivative which is the same thing as the slope and you set it equal to zero, right? So we had the cost equation, marginal cost, or sorry, not marginal cost. We had the cost equation C is equal to four plus two Q squared. And so we wanna know where this has a slope that's zero, right? And what is, what is slope? Slope is nothing more than the marginal cost. So that's why we're going to be taking the derivative with respect to Q, and we're going to be setting it equal to zero. Because we want to find that local minimum. And so the derivative is, uh, so this is going to be, so here, let's do this slowly, c equals, here, I'm going to, I'm going to write it out really simply, four times q to the zero plus two times q squared. And so, since this is a constant, q to the zero is just equal to one, right? And it's just four times one, so that, this whole thing drops out when we take the derivative. And then we're going to do our power rule on this guy, right? So we're going to do, so remember, it, it's c times x to the a. We take this c, we put it outside the brackets, it's still multiplied, and it's then times a times x to the a minus 1. So whenever we have a square, we take that constant, we multiply it by the 2. So the 2 comes down, the a, which is the 2, comes down here. So we have a 2 on the outside. And then it's, oh sorry, 2 times q to the 2 minus 1. And so then we can get rid of the brackets. 2 times 2 is 4. So it's 4 times q, 2 minus 1 is 1. So then it just ends up being 4Q, okay? So this is where a lot of students be like, yeah, I did it, I'm done. You're not done. You gotta set it equal to zero and solve, right? So we set it equal to zero. And then you solve for Q. Exactly. So the only Q, when it, that the only value of Q that when time is four is equal to zero, is zero, right? We could also just divide both sides by four. Zero divided by four is zero. So Q star, the Q minimum for cost, is gonna be four. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry, zero. <laughs> that was a test.
That was a test. And you passed. Good job. Zero. <laughs> No, 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 don't be sorry. Because look at this up here. What value of what value of zero when you times it by four is equal to zero? Or what value of q when you times it by four is equal to zero? It can't be one, it can't be a hundred, you know what I mean? So you could also just divide both sides by four. These fours cancel out, and then zero divided by four is zero. Zero divided by anything is just zero. So that's why it's here. Absolutely. Sorry about the confusion. So the cost, so we would plug that in, yes, and the cost would then be four. So the minimum cost is four, which is the fixed cost. So, the, so but it asks for the level of Q that minimizes the cost. And so the level of Q is zero. So the answer is zero. Yeah. Because it's minimizing the cost. And again, we can we, we can see that from the graph, right? That this is four and the Q is zero. And that's the minimum value on the graph, right? Okay. Now let's do the net benefits. No, 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 what's up? No, you don't have to. I was just that, that that was just me being overly complicated. So just ignore this. If it's a constant, it just goes away. Just remember that. If it's a constant, it just goes away. Because this might confuse you and you might think to do the power rule on that and then zero times. Well, honestly, it does work though, because th then you're gonna be doing zero times q to the negative one, but it doesn't matter. Zero times anything is zero. Just drop it and you just take that constant. You just drop it, exactly. And that's what we're doing in that elasticity chapter, right? We're, we're, we're essentially just using whatever the con whatever the constant is attached to the either own price or cross price or income. We're using that as the thing to multiply the quantity over price to get that point elasticity. So we're used to thinking about elasticity in terms of between two values, right? And now because of calculus and everything like that, now we're getting elasticity at a certain point. And so instead of saying the elasticity as the price goes from eight to nine dollars is this, we're saying the elasticity at nine dollars is this. So again, it's that difference of the secant versus the, the tangent, right? So we used to do something like this. What's the percentage change? Uh, what's, you know, what's the elasticity, price, quantity? We would essentially, we were doing this. We were looking at that line. But now, if we want the elasticity at, you know, the price of $9 or whatever, we're going to look at the tangent of it. So it gives us a more exact estimate. Now, most of the time, the slopes of the, this line, the tangent, and the secant are the same, right? Which is why we were able to do that approximation for so long. But it, it's just, it's more proper to, to get the tangent. Because with, with really steep slopes, really concave and really convex curves, they're going to diverge more and more and more. And then, and then the secant won't actually be that indicative of the real relationship between price and quantity of that. So now let's do uh, maximizing net benefits. So how would we go about maximizing net benefits? What's the first step? So this is 9G on page 24 of the text. Very good. So MBQ minus MCQ, which just be MC. And then we're going to set that equal to zero. So that's one way to do it, absolutely. Right, exactly. So that's the other way to do it. So why don't we do it both ways? So this is going to be the first way. This is kind of the shortcut way, right? In terms of, since we're already given the marginal benefit, we're already given the marginal cost, 
And remember, I told you guys about that golden rule of economics, right? Where you, and this is kind of a breakout box here, where your the optimal quantity, the Q star, is where marginal benefit is greater than or equal to marginal cost. So when we're given marginal benefit and marginal cost, so this is this is kind of saying the same thing as this, right? All we're doing is we're subtracting marginal cost from both sides. This ends up being zero. Marginal benefit minus marginal cost greater than or equal to zero. It's very similar to what Christian did, right? By setting MB minus MC equal to zero. So let's go ahead and do this first, and then we'll create a new equation, take that derivative, and make sure it gives us the same answer, right? So this is going to be version A of how to solve this. Neither one of these is, is going to be correct on, on the exam or whatever. Um, so the marginal benefit is uh, 20 minus 4Q, and then the marginal cost is 4Q. So then I'm going to set this equal to zero, and then I'm going to solve for Q, right? So the first thing I do is I group like items. Negative 4Q, negative 4Q gives me negative 8Q plus 20 equal to zero. Then I'm going to add 8Q to both sides. This annihilates itself. We're left with 20 equal to 8Q. We're going to divide both sides by 8. That cancels out, and we get 20 over 8. That's our optimal quantity that's going to be maximizing our net benefits, 2.5. Questions on how we got to that answer? Okay, now let's do it the other way. So let's go uh, net benefit is equal to benefit of Q minus cost of Q. Okay, so this is version B. Okay, so uh, benefit of Q is 20Q minus 2Q squared. And cost of Q, remember, this is why I always do brackets here, because it's so easy to drop your minus sign. Minus, open bracket, 4 plus 2Q squared, close bracket. Remember to distribute that negative sign to both of those terms. A lot of students make that mistake here and only distribute it to the first one. Minus 2Q squared minus 4 minus 2Q squared. Then I'm going to start grouping like items. So it's just these two. So I end up with, I'm going to bring them over. So it's negative 4Q squared plus 20Q minus 4. And so this is what our net benefit in terms of Q. Does that make sense? Is there a question though? Good? Okay. Yes, the first one is easier. But they're both just as correct. So then we're going to take the derivative of this. All right, so we're going to say the derivative of the net benefit of Q with respect to Q is equal to, so then we're going to have, this is a constant, negative 4 times, and then we'll do the power rule, 2 times Q to the 2 minus 1. And then we have plus 20, and the constant just drops off, right? So let's clean this up a little bit. This ends up being negative 8 Q plus 20. And we're going to be setting this equal to zero. And so then we're going to get the same result. We're going to plus 8Q to both sides. These annihilate each other. We get 20 equal to 8Q. We're going to divide both sides by 8. And we get Q equals 2.5. So both of these methods should give you the same result. Yeah, Christian. Yes, thank you. So it, it, I'm not recording on the other one, but I am recording on this one. And our, we have another participant. Hi, Julia. Let me open up my chat window if you have any questions. Now I can see. Okay, cool. 
<laughs> awesome. Correct. Yes. Well, I mean, really, like any time you're finding the maximum or minimum of any kind of curve that that's like this, the the way to do it is you always take the derivative and you set it equal to zero because you're trying to find that spot where there's no slope, right? There's going to be a bunch of you know this is a bunch of negative slopes here and this is a bunch of positive slopes over here and at the bottom there's zero slope and so that. You can think of that as the same as the derivative. It's exactly the same as the derivative being equal to zero. Um, so dc over dq is equal to zero there. And this is our constant. Good question. So yeah, the, honestly, almost all of economics is taking a derivative and setting it equal to zero. Like I did so much of that in my first year of grad school. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot of it. So does that make sense? Okay. Do we have any other questions? Is there another question in chapter one you guys like me to do, or should we move on to chapter two? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. No problem. No problem. All right. So let's move on and do some chapter two stuff. So now we're going to go to page 59 in the text, or 58. Let's do one with an actual. Do you guys want to do one with consumer surplus? Do you want to do producer surplus? Okay, let's do consumer. Let's do con let's do consumer surplus. So we're gonna do so this is chapter two, page fifty-nine, and this is number five. So we're given the demand curve for product X, so boring, and it's Q D X is equal to three hundred minus two times the price of x. And so the first thing we're asked is what is the inverse demand curve? So how do we find the inverse demand curve? We need to solve for p of x. So we're really just going to isolate this p of x over here. So we're going to say we're going to say, well, QD of X minus 300 is equal to 2, negative 2, times PX. And then I'm going to divide everything by negative 2. So this negative 2 and that negative 2 cancel each other out. And then we've got this fun rule of algebra. I'm sure everybody remembers. You divide two terms by one thing. So if it's A plus B over C, that equals A over C plus B over C. And so we can do that here, and we end up with Q D X over negative 2 plus, because it's negative 300 minus, or over minus 2, right? So it's going to be plus 150 is equal to what? Just P of X, because we isolated it. That's the whole, that's what we were trying to get at, right? And so then we can simplify this a little bit more and just say this is 150 minus 1 half Q X is equal to P X D. So this is the inverse demand function. I just rearrange, I just put this guy over here, and I just made QD X over two, just QX, one half QX. And at the end of the day, the way that you can gut check whether or not you, you kept all the signs right, did everything right, is this should be negative, right? Demand is downward sloping. 
it doesn't matter which way we graph it. If we graph it Q in terms of P or P in terms of Q, the, the coefficient on the variable should always be negative. Does that make sense? So yeah, often, so this is the way that economics and all of our graphs and stuff like that have the situation, but it's an inverse, right? Why is it inverse? What way does the causality actually go? So right, we're used to thinking about graphs like this as X and F of X, right? But that's not really what's going on here. The, the quantity is the function of a price at the end of the day, right? Like we react to prices and we make buying decisions based on prices. So all of this is kind of backwards if you really think about it. So, well, so, so it's essentially the D is just the label that it's a demand curve. And so I just switched it over there. I mean, it's still really, it's still technically there as well. Well, I just, it's just a convention. Right, yeah. It's on, it's there on both of them, but, but it's just usually written only on the, on the variable that's by itself. Right, right. That's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. So for completeness, all of these should say PD, all of them should say Q. That's a very good point. No, no, no. So, okay. So QD over negative two is the same as negative one half times Q D X. So I just pulled the, instead of divided by negative two, I just pulled that out and times to by negative one half. Does that make sense? Because there's always a constant in the numerator. So I essentially, what did I do? I used the math rule. I used a different math rule. So I did, um, I did A times B divided by C is equal to A over C times B over C, right? And so I said, okay, Q D X over two is equal to one times Q D X over two is equal to one over two times Q D X over two. Does that make more sense now? Yeah? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it, in order to do this right, thank you, Jake. So it's just that. Oops. So that's the map. We can we can just split this off and have it times b. My bad. Good good catch. <laughs> but but honestly, QD over negative two just is correct. You don't need to do that. The reason why I did that was because then it lets me know the slope is negative one half, rather than thinking about, you know, this it's, it's just QD over negative two. So that's why, yeah. No. You would you would flip the um, so so yeah that's a very good question. Let's let's we can we can graph this equation up here. No, we're just going to really need, but here, we'll just do it real quick. So if you put Q here and P here, it's the wrong order. Um, but we're still going to get an, a downward sloping curve, right? Where the it's 300 is the X axis intercepts or the Y axis intercepts, right? And then it's going to be a negative two slope. So that's the demand curve. And then the inverse demand curve, which is one that we're always going to be using, is P and Q. And that's going to be 150 minus a half QX, right? So it's going to be 150, and it's going to be a much shallower slope. So this is the inverse demand curve. But they're both telling us the same information. Correct. 
this is the one we're used to looking at, but the stupid book is going to give us this demand curve and make us change it to the inverse demand curve 90% of the time. And that's and part of the reason why that is, is because, again, in reality, the quantity is the thing that's influenced by the price. It's not the price that's influenced by the quantity. Okay? So it's, it's, it's just one of those kind of crappy artifacts of economics um, that, that we just have to live with. I almost failed my qualifying exam because on, on every single graph, I did all the math right and I did all the, you know, the, the advanced graphs and stuff like that right, but on every single graph, I mislabeled it. And I almost failed. It was, it was really, yeah. Luckily, it was my first shot, so I would have had another shot. But regardless, I'm scared. So yeah, that's why I always try and tell people the mnemonic. You know, you just use the alphabet, right? You just count the alphabet. L M N O P Q R S. The P is before the Q when you go left to right, just like when we're when we're reading English. So that's how I remember which one goes first. Okay, awesome. You're very welcome. So. Um, so let's go, so that was the answer to 5A on page 59, so chapter 2, page 59, 5A, the inverse demand curve was the 150 minus, uh, minus 1 half QX, we went ahead and graphed it there too, just for, for fun, and we're, we're going to use that graph because we're asked how much consumer surplus do consumers receive when the price is forty-five dollars? When the price is forty. This is problem B. Yes, sorry, so five B. So uh, forty-five. And so, what's consumer surplus? What is it theoretically or abstractly? extra amount so it's essentially like it's the difference between what people were willing to pay and what they actually paid right so so what's going on in this graph let's say that this is uh, the demand for you know tractors or something right and there's somebody what is this demand curve representing the demand curve is representing the willingness to pay right and so there's a willingness to pay right here of a consumer that's equal to, you know, 140 bucks, right? But the market price is 45. And so the difference minus the price is that individual's consumer surplus. And so this is gonna be 140 minus 45, so it's gonna end up being $95 of consumer surplus. So this is the extra, it's, it's, it's a measure of the extra utility uh, that consumers are getting from the good. It's, it, but really, it just has to do with what consumers are willing to pay and what they actually pay. And so there's more than one consumer of tractors in this market, right? There's going to be another person whose willingness to pay is 130, but they only pay 45, and so they have a consumer surplus of 85. And so on and so forth, right? So this whole slice right here is all consumer surplus for the market. So how would we go about calculating that triangle? Well, we're going to use the area of a triangle equation, right? So the area of a triangle is equal to one half base times height. And so we know the height of the triangle, right? 150 minus 45. But what's the base? So now we're going to have to plug 45 into our, as the P, so we could actually plug it into a regular demand curve and figure out the associated quantity with 45. I mean, we could plug, we could plug it into either one. But just because it's easier, let's just plug it in the demand curve. So we're given the demand curve. QD is equal to 300 minus 2P. And so this is going to be 300 minus uh, 2 times 45, which is 90. So this is going to be equal to 210. 
that make sense to everybody? So we just, that, that this, this was given to us in the prompt. And same thing with the price that was given to us in the prompt. And so I just use that, those two bits of information. This 150, we had to figure that out on our own by getting the inverse demand function, right? So that's why part A comes before part B. The 210, I plugged uh, 45 into the original demand equation. So here it's, uh, so Q is equal to 300 minus two times 45. Two times 45 is, oh, you can't see anything. Two times 45 is 90. 300 minus 90 is 210. So this is the Q at 45. It's the QD at 45. You might want to say like X equals 45, it doesn't really matter. Same thing. That's where I got the 210. So then, the area of this triangle ends up just being one half 210 times one of whatever that ends up being. 105 squared, which is what? <laughs> no idea. One one zero two five. Yeah, you can leave the one of five squared. If it's not a multiple choice, you can leave things in one of five squared or in square root form or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I honestly much prefer these than I do irrational numbers. So I'm with you. Go. All right, awesome. So now. Let's have you guys do some practice on your own. What's a consumer surplus at $30? And let's see, the first person who can give me the correct answer, you gotta get out of jail free card. Uh, $30, here, I'll put it up here. Uh, it's still the same demand curve. Still the same demand curve, still the same equation. How did you get one four four zero zero? So let's do it all together. Next time, keep it to yourself. Let some of the mystery build with everybody else. Okay, so I know you got it. You got you got it. So this is our demand. Our price is thirty this time. So we don't need to, but we can if we want. Draw a new graph, right? The demand curve is going to stay the same in terms of one hundred and fifty. Now we've got thirty. So we need this value, right? We gotta plug the 30 into the QD in order to get that value. So QD is equal to 300 minus two times 30 equals 300 minus 60 equals 240. And that would be the base. Very good. Yep. So this is our base. And then my height is the difference between these two. So 150 minus 130 is 120. So then, because the book is very kind, <laughs> uh, these numbers are very clean. And so our area of a triangle is equal to 1 half base times height is equal to 1 half times 240 times 120. One half of 240 is 120. So it's 120 times 120. So you can leave it as 120 squared. Or if you'd like to write out the whole numbers, it's 14400. And so this is representing how much the consumers would have been willing to pay, but they didn't have to. The 
price was actually $30. And again, why is that? It's because this whole line is all just willingness to pay as a fee. Willingness to pay of that person. Willingness to pay of that person. Willingness to pay of that person. The last person, there's somebody out there who their willingness to pay was only $30. So they got no consumer surplus from the purchase, right? But we're asked about the market consumer surplus. So that's why we're we're adding up all of these individual tiny little you know consumer surplus strips essentially. And we're, we're taking the area of the whole triangle, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Um, so one thing, I, I, I'm not gonna go through a question, but I, last time after class, we talked about just consumer uh, price ceilings and price floors, right? And so just remember, so the way that I remember it, demand, supply, that a price ceiling, uh, when it's working, makes the whole thing look like a house, right? So the price ceiling must be below the equilibrium. So the government says you cannot sell for higher than $3, right? And the equilibrium price is $4. And so because of the fact that when a price ceiling is below the equilibrium, It's binding and in effect. And so, uh, and, and, and again, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's a ceiling. So to me, it, it makes something that looks like a house. Right? <laughs> the roof, the door, you know? Okay, so, um, so price ceiling means that we can't go above that, right? So when we're asked about how much is actually you know, sold or purchased in the market, that is looking at where the price ceiling interacts with the supply curve, right? Because it doesn't matter how much people demand. Nobody's gonna supply it at that price. And so we have to find, so let's say that this supply curve is, is you know, two plus, uh, two plus Q, right? And so then at three, it would be five. Oh wait, two plus Q equals P, and if P is three, that would actually be one. Um, so at $3, there's only one unit that is, uh, that is supplied. And then the demand curve, this would be something like um, you know, nine minus Q. Again, that's equal to P. So then when we put $3 in P, then that's going to be Q is equal to six. And so there might be six demanded here, right? But there's only one supply. So if we're asked what the shortage is, it's going to be five. Six minus one is five. And if we're asked what the you know what, what the actual output is when the price ceiling is in effect, it would be one at that price ceiling value. Okay. So that's price ceilings real quick. And then price floors, very similar. Do the same uh, P equals two, or sorry, P equals nine. Now we're going to do a price floor. So the price floor has to be above the equilibrium to be binding, right? And again, to me, this looks way more like a dance floor, you know, where people are dancing on it and hanging out and having a good time. And so, um, again, that's just a mnemonic that helps me, but it has to be above that equilibrium price. So they'll say, you, you can't sell the goods for less than $5, but the equilibrium price is $4. So then we're asked, well, what ends up happening? Well, uh, when we have a price floor, then we're looking at the demand curve because there's gonna be a surplus this time, right? And so the demand curve is gonna be the actual amount of units that are exchanged. The wording on these problems is always very tricky, so you need to just be careful, right? And so for this one, it would ask, how many goods are exchanged when the price floor is in effect? So when the price floor is in effect at $5, we put that $5 in for the P, 
five equals nine minus Q, we get Q equal to four. And now let's do the supply. Uh, so we put the P in for, so we put $5 on this side, right, on the P, so it ends up being five equal to two plus Q. It ends up being three. All right. Something's wrong with my supply and demand equations, in our, but it's fine. Just for the sake of, I'll come up with a better uh, illustration and put it online, but for the sake of this, we'll say it's just six. And so there's a surplus of two, is the difference here. And there's only gonna be four that are exchanged, right? Because the, they're not gonna be able to unload all six of these at this high price. So at this high price, there are only four people or four units that are gonna be sold, even though they're gonna supply six. Why are they supplying six? Because they're working off their supply schedule, right? And so they're like, oh, sweet, at $5, we're going to make this many units. They're trying to optimize their profit, given the current conditions. And it, they end up overproducing. And that's why we end up with a surplus. Questions? OK. Good. If there are any specific questions, again, that, that like I said, I'll, I'll do a better one and post it online uh, probably tomorrow morning. Um, but if, if you have more questions on it, just send me screenshots, send me uh, examples from the book, and uh, take a look. Okay, so it gets three, unfortunately. Um, let's just real quick talk about elasticity and make sure that we, we understand how to get them. So it's just very, very quickly. Um, so we have a generic demand equation, alpha zero plus alpha x dx plus alpha y dy plus alpha m m plus alpha h h. And so what is this saying? This is saying that the quantity demanded for good X is a function of the price of good X, the price of its, sub of its uh, comp uh, substitute or, or complement, right? Um, the income of the person, and then H. I think H is U.S. advertising. So we're given a, a particular example at the bottom of page 80, where we have Q D X is equal to 100, so some constant, that's the alpha, minus 3 P X, um, that's, that's, so this is the alpha X and this is the price of the, the good X. Then we've got plus 4 P Y, that's the price of another good, uh, plus half of that, minus 0 0.01 M, this is the income elasticity number, and then plus two times A of X. And so then we're asked, what's the own price elasticity? So the own price elasticity, QX, DX. And so the way that we figure this out is we, yeah, sorry. The way that we figure this out is we find what, where is the variable that's attached to PX, right? It's negative three, the constant that's attached to PX, it's negative three, right? And so we're gonna pull that down, and then we're gonna multiply it by the price over quantity. And so the rest of it's pretty much plug and chug. So what if we had QDX equals negative 75 minus 8px plus 2py minus 0.03m plus 3ax. And I asked you the same kind of thing. What would what would you be multiplying px? Oops, sorry. What would you be multiplying px over qx by? 
Negative eight. Very good. Okay. Awesome. And x minus. Now, what if we're doing the cross price elasticity? And we wanted to know the elasticity with respect to qx and py. Then instead of px in the numerator, we would have py. And then what are we going to do? Let's use this one. What, what, what number would we use right here? We use positive 2. Yes, because that's the number that's associated with that numerator. There. And then the last one that we need to know is the income elasticity, right? So if we were concerned about the income elasticity, qx and m, it would be length times m over qx. And again, we're going to use whatever variable is attached, whatever constant is attached to that m. That's the thing that we're going to be multiplying that fraction by. It was negative, well, so it was negative three. Oh, it was an own price elasticity, own price. And then this is a cross price. And then this is an income elasticity. All right, so what I think I'll do is I'll make a video about the regression stuff since I, I'm, I'm really well versed in that. I taught econometrics for, for many years. So I'll make a video for you guys and push that out um, with some problems and stuff. Uh, if you need me to, though, we can, we can extend chapter four is supposed to be good this weekend, right? So why don't we extend chapter four because we didn't cover it yet. Like I said, I'll release a video for the rest of chapter three. Just do a couple questions real quick, first 10 minutes of class on Monday, and then we'll jump into chapter two. No, you're right, Wednesday. Wednesday. We, yeah, we should have class next Friday. Is that okay with everybody? We have class next Friday? I think we need it. All right, and like I said, any questions that you guys may have, please, please feel free to email me, um, screenshots, page numbers, whatever. Um, the, more, the more feedback I get, the more personalized I can make the class in terms of helping, helping you guys uh, clear those paths. Up. Yes, I can meet tomorrow. Can you want to meet tomorrow? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, perfect, yeah, I can meet tomorrow. I'll email you guys back uh, in the afternoon. I have to cancel my office hour that's coming up right now, though. I gotta go help Gene Tucker and Katie Wood. So, uh, but yeah, I'll have more office hours tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I'll just get here early at like 10:30. Well, it'll be here to for your for your. Does that work? Okay.
Right. No, that's that's crazy. Makes no sense. Yeah, everything's petitioned. Okay. And Christian, what do you want to have like? If 